Yes. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to Winning Tuesday. You found me. I told you guys we were doing a slight schedule change and we're all here. Class is getting ready to get started. We are doing this topic tonight, Huntington's disease. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Georgia in the house on tonight. So we're going to be talking about Huntington's disease. I'm not sure if I ever presented on this topic before, but I'm excited to because it's in the Quick Facts book. If you have this book, you know, Huntington's disease. Let me know what page it is on in the comments. We're going to get into it, though, because this is a topic that you want to be able to at least understand the presentation of it. And my goal for you tonight is to know how Huntington's disease is different from similar diseases that present like Huntington's. So if you haven't studied this topic, you're in for a treat because we're going to get into it tonight. Let's go, guys. So Huntington's disease, it is a hereditary degenerative neurological disease, okay? And so there's a protein order, but this, a protein disorder, but this disease is actually autosomal dominant. So it is very, very hereditary, okay? Commonly shows up in ages 30 to 50 years old. We talk about Huntington's disease. There is no cure. There is no cure for this condition, but it can be reduced. The symptoms of this condition can be reduced with medication. So again, we talk about Huntington's disease. This is a process that happens to a patient and they really can't do anything about it. And their nerve cells or the neurons in parts of the brain, they gradually break down and die. Are you guys tracking me? Are you understanding what Huntington's disease is doing to the patients? And so the disease actually attacks areas of, of the brain that control voluntary and intentional movement as well as other areas. So this has been my hobby horse this week. I want you guys to press into critical thinking as we go over the com the content. And so I'm asking you questions right now and I wanna see the comments on the screen, okay? So we said that Huntington was, uh, I'm back to writing again. Huntington is neurodegenerative. So that means that the brain cells are dying. I want you guys to tell me what other conditions are neurodegenerative that NCLEX can put in comparison, put in comparison to Huntington's disease. So I'm gonna write down Huntington's disease because it is neurodegenerative. Um, Huntington's, what else? I'm writing, what else am I writing down? Okay, so we have Huntington's. What else? All right. Um, this book right here, if you don't have it, you can go to my website, remartnurse.com, and get this book. Okay, this is Quick Facts. Parkinson's. Yes, Parkinson's. There's something else I'm looking for. There's two more that I'm looking for, actually. Ah, I see it here. Okay. Um, Dementia. Okay, I'm gonna put Alzheimer's, but we 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 can say just because there's different categories of dementia, but I'm gonna put Alzheimer's because we study that one. Uh there's one more. So people are saying MS neurodegenerative. Um, okay, but well, mm, I don't want to put MS on here. I don't want to put MS on here in the same way. What else? Ah, ALS. Let's put ALS on here. Okay. You know what ALS is? Somebody put what ALS. Somebody might not know what ALS is. Okay. So Huntington's disease. Just from what we learned about it, guys, we know that it is affecting parts of the neuron, parts of the brain. And so these parts of the brain control voluntary movements, right? And so Parkinson's disease, we also know that this is affecting parts of the brain and it is going to be controlling the voluntary movements. Alzheimer's, we know this is also neurodegenerative, affecting parts of the brain, right? ALS, yes, Lou Gehrig's, definitely. 
parts of the brain is affecting um, is affecting involuntary movements. All right. So look, look at this right here. Look, look how important it is. Oh, and I even see Gillian Bure. That's a good one. I didn't think of that one as well. Um, but so look here. Look how many, look how many subjects on NCLEX are going to deal with your patient having alterations in their body movements. How are we going to know the difference by doing a hundred questions, a hundred random questions on these topics? No, 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 no. We are going to focus on the one today. And then the one will help us to be able to differentiate everything else because there's something very specific about Huntington's disease. I mean, I can even put, because you guys are giving some good ones. So, all right, we can put Gillian Bure. Content more than questions, okay? Um, and then we can put multiple sclerosis. What else? What is ALS? All right, hold on. Nurse Jakia says this. I took my NCLEX yesterday for RN and found out I passed it this morning. I'm officially a Remar nurse. Congratulations. <laughs> this is the time to celebrate you and all your hard work. Congratulations. NCLEX RN is a bear. It is not easy. So you did it. You did it. Congratulations. Um, nurse Robinson says, I passed my NCLEX guys. Just as simple. Pass my NCLEX. So, so happy for you too as well. We are celebrating you. And everybody that writes congratulations, I'm just telling you, if you can write a congratulations, you're next. If you can just take the time out to congratulate somebody, you are on your way too, because it's that positivity that actually allows you to be celebrated one day. Yeah, yeah. The nurse Karen says, look, I, I'm next already, okay? I'm next. All right, so already you guys know already you guys know this is a list of movement disorders this is a list of movement disorders all of them why is huntington different what is the one thing that makes huntington's disease different from all these other ones what's the one thing because they're all neurodegenerative Okay, they all have problems with movement. Y'all already know it. Okay, I'm gonna keep going on though. Until somebody puts it on the screen, I'm gonna keep going. Let's keep learning more about it. But you guys already know enough to pass NCLEX. Mm. All right, here we go. So anyways, look what happens here in the healthy brain versus the Huntington brain, right? And so in the Huntington's brain, you see that the ventricles are you see that the ventricles are enlarged and you guys are so smart. You already have it. So did everybody see, if you can see the comments on the screen, what's the major difference between Huntington's disease and the rest of these things? Mm -hmm. Leah, you got it. This is the only one that's inherited. See, there you go. And so right now, when we talk about all these similarities, Huntington's disease is, is extremely special because you get this from your mama or your daddy, all right? Um, and so you guys are, are rocking it already with the content. All right, class is over, that's all I got. Okay, so anyways, here we go. Let's, let's press into it some more. Now, when you look at the healthy brain and the Huntington's disease brain, um, what is happening is that you can see that the ventricles are enlarged. This is something that is significant, okay? This is something that's significant because what does it mean if the ventricles in your brain are getting bigger? That, that space, you know the ventricles, you have an opening in your brain? And they start out like maybe like this. I mean, this is not to scale at all. But like what's happening if the hole in your brain is getting bigger and bigger? What does that mean? What does that mean? Congratulations, Lisa. I like that. I've never seen it spelt like this before. Is this Lisa? Thank you so much, Regina, for your motivation, your encouragement. I'm officially a registered nurse. Remar is the best. Thank you so much. Thank you. Congratulations. And you have a new life. 
I'm, I'm excited for, for whatever you will be doing tomorrow. Cause I bet you it won't be studying for NCLEX like the rest of us. All right. Um, no, 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 no. So you guys are saying pressure, but remember that's not the issue here. We never talked about increased is increased intracranial pressure. Something we're worried about. Okay. No, that's not. So don't, don't, um, don't overthink it. Don't overthink it. I think I saw it. I think I saw Ah, here it is. Here we go. This is why the comments are so important. Let me find it. I got to go back up. Mm. Oh, who said it? Who said it? Uh, so, okay, so not, oh, here we go. The brain is getting smaller. Okay. So as the, the hole and the brain is growing, let me go back to the picture. What's happening? The actual brain tissue is getting smaller. It's actually getting smaller. You have less neurons. You have less brain tissue, right? It doesn't have anything to do with increased cranial pressure. We're not worried about it. We're not worried about it. Yes, the neurons are dying, okay? And so what does that mean for the ability of your patient as the brain is degenerating, as the neurons are dying, as the brain is getting smaller and smaller? What is their capacity for activities, reasoning, uh, what, what are they going to be able to do? Probably, probably not much. Okay. So when we're learning about these topics, every little word that we start with matters. Okay. So I don't want you to bring in too much, too much. When, when we talk about neurodegenerative disorders, Huntington's, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, ALS, Guillain-Barre, multiple sclerosis, do we have to worry about increased intracranial pressure for any of these conditions? Mm -mm. So let's just take, let's start, let's just make a decision that we will not, we won't add that. Okay. We won't add that, but the brain is getting smaller. So with these conditions, what do we have to worry about? We have to worry about what neurons are degenerating. We have to worry about what muscles are being affected. All right. So it's more of a muscular issue. All right. Than a pressure issue. Okay. All right. We're, we're doing content. This is how you do it. This is how you do it. So we are seeing that with Huntington's disease, we know the major point is that this is inherited. We know that another major point is that the muscles will be affected. This is also called Huntington's chorea. So we know that the brain functionality is going to degenerate and decline. So what are some other symptoms? You guys did a great job with this already in terms of the cognitive decline. Another specific thing about Huntington's disease is that these patients are going to have a change in their mood. And you see here, happy and sad face. So they're going to have some bipolar-like tendencies. Yes, if you have, uh, if you have the quick facts, I'm going to read it in a little bit, but they're going to have some bipolar-like tendencies. That means they're going to be feeling really good, a manic stage, and then they're going to fall into a depression. Can you understand why that would happen? Can you understand why somebody with Huntington's disease would have this experience? All right. The involuntary movements called chorea, they're going to have hallucinations, they're going to have speech difficulties. And this condition is also going to affect their personality and their behavior. Is there anybody who does not understand why a person with Huntington's disease would have depression, would have personality changes? Are we all clear on that? Okay. So, Think about it. Think about and what age does this manifest? I, th I think I said it in the slide before. Let me see if I can go back to it really quickly. This manifests, I know I wrote it. Didn't I write it down? 30 to 50, okay? 30 to 50, 30 to 50. So I see some people here saying, I don't understand why they're going to have depression. What is the cause for the depression, the mood swing, the personality changes? Well, we have to think about um, we have to think about the degenerative nature of the brain. So you have specific functions or personality or in different parts of the brain. Right. And so as those neurons begin to die off, 
then you're going to change in your personality. You're going to have a depressive state in your patient because they're a young person. What if you're not 30? Think about what you want to do when you're 30. And if you're past 30, think about what you were doing when you're 30 years old and think about not being able to fulfill those functions because you are suffering from movement disorders. So yes, it's a Nicola, it's a sudden life change. All right. It's a sudden life change. And you know, what is the prognosis for this? When you get this condition, is it going to be, you know what? You're going to bounce back from this. You're going to recover from this. What is the difficult conversation that you have to have with your Huntington's patient? What's the prognosis for this condition? Yes. Okay. So um, this is something that is going to have a severe effect and a severe effect on your patient. And how about this? Let's talk about this. If your patient has Huntington's disease, what do we have to tell them about family planning? What do we, what do we have to tell the young man that is 34 years old and diagnosed with Huntington's disease? Maybe he may not even know he, he had it or his parents had it. I don't know. Maybe he does. Maybe he was adopted. What do we have to tell them, right? We got to tell them if you have kids, they can most likely, they can most likely be in the same situation that you are in, okay? So um, that's, those are some serious reasons why this patient is going to have some uh, mood swings, okay? Mood swings. Depression mania. All right, let's go into it. Huntington's disease. I hope we're getting a picture of what this patient is and what it means to take care of this patient. And more importantly, let me just say this. When you become a nurse, when you become a nurse, seriously, guys, we need to, we need to love on our patients at the same time. This is supposed to be a ministry. All right. So we need to do that. We need to love on our patients and we need to be nice to them. We need to be nice to them because this Huntington's disease is a neurological disorder and the neurological effects can lead to bigger complications such as malnutrition, such as infections, such as eating difficulties. All right. And so when you think about this condition being possibly fatal, when you think about this condition being possibly fatal, how can it be? All right. How can it be like malnutrition? What is that going to do to your patient systemically? Infections. All right. Eating difficulties. So this is one of the conditions for our patient. All right. Okay, guys. Okay. And so I was saying, when you're taking care of a patient with Huntington's disease, you have to be nice. Like you need to be nice in general as a nurse, but understand when people are in the hospital, they're dealing with real things. So whatever problems you have in your personal life, don't bring that to the job. Don't bring it to the job because if you have a patient with Huntington, they really have a reason to be sad. All right. And so whatever cheer you can give them is going to be so important, okay, for the time that they are with you. So how is Huntington's disease diagnosed? It is diagnosed through a medical history, a family history, of course, um, neurological examinations. And this is just general. This is just general. You could do an MRI. You could do a CT. You could do a PET scan. Um, laboratory tests, genetic tests, if necessary, okay, if necessary. And let's talk about our treatment and look at our treatment. I saw the question, I think I saw somebody said, how do you do primary uh, prevention with Huntington's disease? You, you can't do primary prevention with Huntington's disease. I guess, yeah, no, you can't do it for yourself. You could do it for offspring, but that doesn't really count, right? 
So it's a it's an inherited condition. So there's nothing that you can do to stop the process of it. That was a great question, though. It was a great question. So anybody with Huntington's disease, I think we have to look at secondary in our tertiary treatment. Secondary would be, of course, to um, identify it as quickly as possible. Uh, and then the treatment tertiary is going to be physical therapy. OK, that is going to be to help to optimize the walking and the coordination Swallow therapy to help you or help the patient eat, chew, and swallow safely. Nutritional supplements if the patient is not able to eat adequately or if they have an infection, which we know patients can develop an infection, man. And so let's um, talk about the medications. Let's talk about the medications. Tetrabenazine is, uh, it is a central nervous system medication and it helps the chorea associated with Huntington's disease and antipsychotic medications as well, antipsychotic medications as well to help the violent outbursts. So what I want to do now is I want you guys to anticipate the care of this patient. Okay. What is this screen? Let's see. Ah, here we go. The Huntington's illness, the prognosis of it, we talked about it. The Huntington's illness currently has a poor prognosis. The typical life expectancy would be 10 to 20 years. Okay. So if you are diagnosed with this at 30, uh, then you know the maximum that you would be expecting to live would be maybe 20 years, okay? So I see some questions about the Huntington's patient. So now, you know, we're gonna study these ones later, okay, together. I may already have done some of these, but Huntington's disease. Let's talk about what this patient will look like clinically, what your nursing responsibilities are. So um, let's talk about this. What diet, because I saw that question, what diet would we have for our patient with Huntington's disease? What diet? Knowing their difficulties. What diet are we going to have? <laughs> I'm so happy that you're here. So just to be clear, this is your first time joining us. We do this every Monday and we do this on Wednesday. But we, uh, so we do this Monday at noon and then we also do this Wednesday at nine o'clock p.m. Uh, but today is Tuesday, ironically, and I'm just doing it a day early because I'm going to Las Vegas tomorrow and I'm so excited, okay? All right, so anyways, you guys, are, you guys are putting it down. Our Huntington's patient is going to be, I like this. We're going to puree that food. We're going to thicken that food up. But it will be a mechanical soft diet, okay? So that's what we're going to do, the diet. Um, I said that this patient is at risk for what? This patient was coming to your room. What would they be at risk for? What, what kind of precautions are you going to put in this patient's room? I don't know about, I, um, we're going to say mechanical soft over, we're going to say mechanical soft over high protein for now, for now. There we go. I said, what would the patient be at risk for? Rose, you got it. Tatiana, you got it. This patient's going to be a falls risk. Yes. Aspiration risk. Okay, let's talk ketogenic diet. Oh, glory. Um, what, let's talk about the mentation of our patient. There's other safety concerns that we need to be monitoring this patient for. What safety concerns are you going to be monitoring the Huntington's patient for? There's one more that I think we need to screen them for. Just because we know of the... I say I said fall. So the the gate suction at the bedside, definitely suction at the bedside. But I'm looking for a screening. Um, 
Am I worried about seizures here? I'm not worried about seizures, baby. I know you guys see, see, there's another screening that I think is very important because of how the patient will be thinking. I'm trying to give y'all all the clues without giving you the answer. And it's something that you do on admission because you want to know where the patient is. There we go. Tenzing, you got it. I'm, I'm going to do, for next-gen NCLEX, I'm going to do suicide risk. I'm going to do a suicide screening because I need to know. Remember, we said this patient can be depressed. Yeah. Neurodegenerative. So, yeah, I definitely would do. Would I do a Glasgow coma or no? Would you guys, do you think a Glasgow coma would be appropriate for this patient with Huntington's disease? It's a good, it's a good point. That's why I just want to bring it out. Do we do Glasgow comas for neurodegenerative diseases? No, no, we wouldn't do it. We wouldn't do that. Okay. Uh, I saw somebody put this on here. We talked about the diet. Are we worried about, are we worried about dermal pressure ulcers for this patient? Are we worried about dermal pressure ulcers? Mm. So ooh, some people are saying yes. Some people are saying no. I'm formulating my final answer right now. Um, man. This is my answer. Ooh, this is my answer for DVUs. The answer is so many reasons why. I know it's like, but I am worried about it. I'm worried about it for several reasons because I'm not sure about the mobility of this patient right away. I'm worried. Anybody that's on a anybody that's on an altered diet, in my opinion. If you are on a like a mechanical soft, a pureed, a thickened liquid, a clear liquid diet, or an MPO diet, I feel like you could be at risk for pressure ulcers. All right. Let's talk about this thing. I want you to put some on this in on the screen. Huntington's patients, Huntington's patients, knowing all that you know about them. What infections are they at risk for? What infections are they at risk for? I can only think of one, right? Why, why am I blanking? What infections are they at risk for? Mm. Oh, that's a good one. We're learning together. Mm-hmm. I'm cheating off some of your answers. Yeah, that's a good one, too. Um, all right, so there's some I don't agree with. Okay, so these are the ones on the onset. I had pneumonia. I had pneumonia. And I think one of the leading causes for people with Huntington's disease that die is pneumonia. You know what kind of pneumonia it actually is? What kind of pneumonia is it? Because there are many different types of pneumonia for next-gen NCLEX that you need to know. But specifically for this patient with Huntington's disease, yeah. So not, uh, not, not a bacterial pneumonia, but it is this one. Cindy has it. Victoria has it. Yeah, it's an aspiration pneumonia. Why is that? Yep. You, I think you should be aware if you haven't studied aspiration pneumonia or you're not sure what it is or how patients get it, you need to know aspiration pneumonia. It's over here. Okay. Okay. What, what other one? And then I also have respiratory infections just because patients with um, neurogen, any, let me say this, anytime that a patient is not mobile, and they're not moving around a whole bunch. They have, and they're not eating well. They have a compromised immune system, and so it's easy for you to catch respiratory infections, viral infections, and then also when you have 
uh, a neurodegenerative disorder, sometimes you're not able to cough as much, right? And so coughing actually helps you to get rid of pulmonary congestion. And so if you can't do that, it's, it's more likely to have um, respiratory infections. Urinary tract infections, urinary tract infections, why would the patient with Huntington's disease get urinary tract infections? How could that be? How could that be? What is going to be a cause of that? I think nurses could do it for sure. If nurses were, um, you know, straight cathing them, I suppose. But also um, incontinence, urinary stasis, poor hygiene. Yes, poor hygiene. Specifically in women, specifically in women, women can get urinary tract infections a lot if the hygiene is not on point, all right? Dehydration, dehydration, urinary stasis, good job. And so this is what I love. We haven't even gotten to the questions yet, but look, just studying the content, look what studying the content is like. This is what it's like to study the content. I need y'all to share this video right now so I can get a thousand people watching this. We have over 900 people studying Huntington's disease right now. Like 900 people on a random Tuesday night. This is my, you guys are my army right now. Where else can you find 900 students talking about aspiration pneumonia? Never, nowhere, ever, nowhere. From New Zealand, New Zealand in the house too. I mean, where even is that at? We have people from all over the planet. All right. Is there any aliens on tonight representing the, the intergalactic spaces? Let me know. Okay. Let me know because I'm just, it's just give, giving like, it's just giving all types of planetary vibes tonight. Qatar, we're in Nigeria in the house, not even in class. You can't even find nine people studying in a class. We have 900. All right. Okay. So now we, we, we did it. We did the study. Okay. I got questions now. I like, I actually have actual questions now. So let's go to the questions. Comments on the screen. Guyana, I see you. Question number one, Huntington's disease. <laughs> I like that. Uh, Huntington's disease is known, is also known as number one, Huntington's syndrome. Two, Huntington's neuritis, three, Huntington's chorea, Huntington infection. All right, here we go. All right, Japan, shout out to Japan. Shout out to Mars in the house, got an actual Martian representing on tonight. Love it. Which one? I mentioned this word a lot of times. I mentioned this word a lot of times tonight. So this should be easy. As much content as we did tonight, we should be getting a five out of five. All right. We did a lot of content on tonight. Number three, I think it's the place to be here. Correct answer. You got it. Number three, Huntington's Korea. Korea is, okay, it is the Greek word that means dance. All right. And so what happens is the uncontrolled movements are the main symptom of Huntington's disease. This illness has also been called chronic progressive chorea. This means that the symptoms get worse over time. If you are studying from Quick Facts for NCLEX, uh, I have here uncontrolled movements called chorea. Huntington's disease is one of the topics in this book. And so you have um, muscle rigidity is noted. Impaired gait, impaired judgment, and cognition are common. And cognition are common. Good job, everybody, on that question. Here's the next one up for you. It is this. Huntington's disease mainly affects which body system? Single choice answer. One, cardiovascular. Two, nervous system. Three, lymphatic system. Four, respiratory system. Okay, respiratory system. You remember that? Ethan says, okay, I remind myself that Huntington is from Korea. Okay. All right. Korea. Here we go. What, what nervous system, what lymphatic system, what respiratory system, what cardiovascular system is affected by Huntington's disease? Which one is it? Which one is it? 
Remar nurses are unanimously declaring it is nervous system. And you guys got it right here. Huntington's disease causes certain brain cells and neurons to die. And so over time, this affects the way a person feels, thinks, and moves. The death of the neurons can cause jerky movements, which we talked about is being chorea. And then it also can cause dementia as well. Dementia as well. All right. So next question is this, what causes the brain cell damage in people with Huntington's disease? Were you paying attention to me when I said this? <laughs> what causes the brain cell damage in people with Huntington's disease? Is it number one, a lack of oxygen? Two, poor nerve development. Three, abnormal protein. Four, none of the above. None of the above cause this. What say if you guys here? Mm. Comments coming in so very fast. Can't believe it. And this one, I'm noticing here, this one is a mixed bag of answers. I got some twos, I got some fours, I got some threes. But only one answer is right here. And I said it. I said it in the beginning. Did you catch it? Correct answer is... A is number three. It's an abnormal protein. It's an abnormal protein on the DNA or the genetic strand of the patient. And so a genetic defect causes the brain to make an abnormal version of a protein called Huntington. And then the protein affects neurons and parts of the brain that control movement and thought, destroying them. So um, they're still trying to learn how this protein affects normal or interferes with normal cell activity. Did you get it? Did you get it? Good job, Mavia. She says, I got it. Okay. All right. For the rest of you, here's another question. In which age group does Huntington usually first appear? Number one, 18 to 25. Two, 80 to 90 year old. Three, 30 to 40 year old. Four, 60 to 70 year old. Which one are we going to go with? Talking about Huntington's disease. Love it. Love it. You guys are doing amazingly well. Amazingly well. And no fooling you on this one. Correct answer was indeed 30 to 40 years old. Huntington's disease most often strikes in the middle of life. It can also show up in children though. And what I read about it showing up in children is that children have uh, even faster progressive uh, muscular neurodegenerative decline. It, it's very, it's very severe. About 15,000 people in the U.S. have Huntington's disease, but another 150,000 have a 50% risk of developing it. Developing it, Huntington's disease can be found worldwide. Final question: Huntington's disease is an inherited illness passed on from one parent generation to another. If a parent has Huntington's disease, if one parent has Huntington's disease, what is the chance of a child developing Huntington's disease? Is it 150% to 75%, 3%, 10%, 4, 90%. Here we go, guys. Here we go. On the road, on the road. Okay, on the road, let's do, let's do this question. Let's do this question. 50, 75, 10, 90%. The correct answer is going to be, the correct answer is going to be 50%, 50%. And I just told you guys that, just told you guys that. <laughs> so remember, that this is an autosomal dominant condition, all right? Um, and so if you go back to, listen, if we just go back to anatomy, we just go back to our basic anatomy, genetics, biology, autosomal dominant means a 50% chance. It's like one out of two parents, you got 50% chance of getting it. So it's very severe, all right? Very severe. Now, if this is your first time joining us, whoo, 
Ooh, and you got like a three out of five, a four out of five, even a five out of five. You did tremendous. Huntington's disease, in the book, Quick Facts, when I look at Huntington's disease, and as I was preparing for it tonight, you look at it and it's not that big of a section as I find it. Ooh. Okay, so Huntington's disease, if you look at it, it's not that big of a section, like half a page. You can't really see it. It's like half a page. But when you actually sit down and read upon it, you have so many, um, you know, you have so many questions to yourself. You guys should be reading quick facts and you should be thinking of what is my nursing care look like? What does this person need when they come into the hospital? All right. What does this person need when they come and get into the hospital? Yes, I can bring it back. I might, you, you want me to just, they want me to read number five. Let me go back to it. Okay. A single abnormal gene on chromosome number four causes Huntington's disease. Chromosome number four is one of the 22 chromosomes that aren't linked to gender. This means both men and women have an equal chance of inheriting. Okay. Huntington's disease, Huntington's disease. All right, any questions about that? All right, so again, part of doing extremely well on the NCLEX is knowing the intimate versions of a, um, of a topic, okay, of a big topic. Huntington's disease is a huge topic on the NCLEX because because it mimics so many other conditions. And so if a nurse knows the difference between Huntington's disease and Parkinson's disease, that's a safe nurse. All right. So in you when you are studying this, consider Huntington's disease a wrap. You guys know it. And that's because you showed up to class. Some of you need to show up to class because as simple as this book is, you're not a reader. That's not how you learn best. Some of you are auditory learners, meaning you could read this in a book, but until I say it, it doesn't click all the way, right? Until you hear it, because you're an auditory learner, until you hear it, then you're like, oh, I got it. I got it. I understand it now. All right. Because the same thing is here in quick facts. It's the same thing, except for you needed to hear it. OK, you need to hear it. And so, yes, it does not take long. It doesn't take long to prepare for NCLEX, but you have to move out of a state of I'm not really sure what to do. I'm not really sure what to study. And then at the same time, I don't know how to study. So combination. This is how you pass NCLEX right here combination of this book and combination of these lectures, okay? These lectures, especially if you are an audio learner. If you're an audio learner, okay, then this is the program for you because these lectures are gonna support that particular learning style. And if you are, um, if you're a visual learner, if you are a visual learner, then it's absolutely gonna support that learning style, all right? So I want to show you just simply what visual learners need, okay? And this is what you need if you're a visual are learner. Really important to know for your exam. We're going to talk right. about several you need kinds to of have diets, the reason why the patients are prescribed them and the foods that right. they can or cannot have. Let and I literally, I just love playing my videos out because it grabs you. My videos grab you in, okay? They, they grab you in if you're a visual learner. They engage you if you're an audio learner. All right. And so I'm trying to I'm trying to disperse knowledge because you don't have to. You don't have to spend months and months preparing for this exam. And there's 900 people right now. There's 900 people right now that are studying for this exam. And if in this short amount of time you learned a lot about something that you weren't familiar with at the start of this, then I can absolutely guarantee that you have, number one, a lot more to learn. You have a lot more to study, but also number two, you are able to pass this test. 
That's that is the main thing that you get when you're able to just comprehend basic knowledge. And so if you're a person that struggled in nursing school because you had to read 10 chapters and then be tested on it and you felt like you weren't getting it, okay, you don't have to have that same experience when it comes to preparing for NCLEX. NCLEX is something you actually can control. You actually can control how you prepare for NCLEX. You don't have to leave it up to anybody. You get to decide how you want to study, when you want to study, and how long you want to study. So when you message me and say, hey, I've been out of school for 10 years, you think I can pass NCLEX? My answer is going to be absolutely. You can pass NCLEX because you've been out of school for 10 years. And because you graduated from nursing school, I know you can pass the NCLEX. Nursing school is much harder than the NCLEX. So you can, you will, you must pass NCLEX. But there are certain things you have to do. Just like this class tonight, your attendance is not optional. Your attendance is required when you want to pass NCLEX. You can't not show up. You have to show up because nobody else is coming to take this test for you. Nobody else is coming. There is no help. So you have to go in there and be competent enough to take the exam. And when I show up to class and you're not here, then you stand me up. I'm coming to, to have a one-to-one -one with you and you don't show up. OK, so. There has to be some um, there has to be some mind shifting and people get mad when I tell you all this. People get mad when I say you guys should not be worrying about money right now. You should not be worrying about money because you are the money. You're the money. You don't make money. You are money. Your knowledge, what's in your head, the very fact that you were able to even understand what I was talking about tonight. If where's our study guide out? If I took this on the streets of Las Vegas tomorrow and I went up to anybody walking and said, What's Huntington's disease? What is that? What's Parkinson's disease? What's Alzheimer's? Some people might know Alzheimer's because it's like in the, you know, it, it's in the movies and people have it, a lot of people have it, but. What's the difference between Parkinson's and, and, and Alzheimer's and Gillian Barre? People would be like, what language are you even speaking? What is a Gillian Barre? Okay. But because you know that, guys, you're you're the money. Okay. You you guys, you're once you do this very small thing, once you do this very small thing of investing in yourself, okay, just a small shift into what is really valuable, your life is going to change. It's going to change, but it won't change if you don't see yourself as the prize. Like you have to understand when you walk into the room, the atmosphere shifts because when you show up into the room, there's a medical professional on board. Like when you show up into a space, you're unique. You're different from everybody else. You're different from everybody else because everybody has a body. Everybody here tonight, except for the one girl from Mars that's on tonight. Everybody else, we have a human body. But guess how many people actually know about their human body? How many people actually know what their kidneys are doing? How many people actually know that there are four chambers in their heart? How many people actually know what increases their blood glucose levels? The majority of people don't know about the one thing that they are born with. Like the majority of people do not know about their body that they spend literally all of their time in. And because you know about the body, 
You're like the unicorn. You're the one everybody's looking for. They need you to come to work. If you're just joining this class, we've gone through so much together tonight. It was the best of times tonight. So anyways, I say all this to say, you're special. Start acting like it. Start acting like you're the prize and that you have to get things done. And when you are not getting things done, particularly, you know, <laughs> this NCLEX thing, people are not doing well. People are literally waiting for you to become a nurse because you have knowledge that common people don't have. And you went to school for this. What are you doing working at wherever you're working? Okay. You do miss a lot. So I got to go pack y'all. I'm so behind, but I'm glad I got to do winning Wednesday because, um, you know, this is important. This is an important part of our community and our social group. And it's good for our mental health during this process. This is a hard process and it's long sometimes, but it doesn't have to be lonely because we have each other now. Okay. <laughs> okay, guys. Oh, Lord. This is good. The classes are, okay, five minutes. Ask me anything, five minutes. Okay. Miss um, Regina, your classes is in Monday and Wednesday. Yes, Mondays at noon, Eastern Standard Time. And then Wednesdays at 9 p.m. We burn the midnight oil on Wednesday. Okay. You are class of 2023. I love that. I just saw myself in a class of 2018, Remar Nurses class of 2018. And I was talking to them and I was encouraging them. So you literally have, I think, what, four more months until the next class rolls in here. And I don't want to see you. Okay. Um, okay. That's a good question. Here we go. When do I take my CAT exam? Okay. All right. So let me just go. Let me show you my study calendar to my program really quickly. And I believe it is here. Okay. So if you have V2, if you have V2 and you go to your question bank, right underneath your question bank is your file vault. You're going to click on file vault. You'll click on course resources and it will pull up your um, registered nurse or practical nurse. When you click on download study calendar or calendar, this calendar will show up. Bam, bam, bam. This is the schedule for what you will be doing every day. Okay. And you can see when you finish, there's only 20, there's just 20 study sessions. Okay. There's 20 study sessions that you will go through that will go through this course and through this program heavy on content, heavy on content. But I'm going to drop down to the very end of the program and you have your two computer adaptive exams here. Okay. So the first one you are going to take after study session number 20. And then the next one you're going to take um, CAT exam number two is a week before your test date. Okay. A week before your test date. Uh, Lydia, if you look under your profile, you should be able to renew your subscription there. Or if you never cancel your subscription, Lydia, it will automatically renew itself. It's a pleasure, Suzanne, to have you. Suzanne Jean, is that your middle name? It's a pleasure to have you here with us tonight. Karen says, I finally passed my second CAT exam with 90 questions. Ooh, I'm ready for Friday. You are ready. You're definitely ready. God bless you on your exam and all of your hard work. Okay. God bless you on your exam. I'm, let me see what else. Um, but the schedule is only focused on farm. No, 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 no. Schedule is not focused on farm. There's a many things in the schedule. Tina, am I saying that right? Lots of content here. So you're not just doing farm. Um, in the beginning of the program, you are doing your every day. You have to watch. You have to read something and you have to answer something. So you'll see that every day you're learning a different subject. You're doing subject reviews. OK, you're doing subject reviews. So there's progress exams. Yes, but I wouldn't say it was focused on farm. 
if you are doing your if you're doing your content in B2, the pharmacology is going to come more so from your quick facts book, the pharmacology section. So you'll be learning a lot of your, pharm your pharmacology from here. What else? Um, email me, support at remarreview.com. Okay. Support at remarreview.com. Somebody said, oh my goodness, I finished. Carla says, I finished, but I never did the CAT exam. It's there for you. It's there for you. So make sure with V2, you're having the lecture content there. My lecture reviews are there. You also have the question bank and then you have two computer adaptive exams. So you have everything you need in the V2. So make sure you try to do, you know, the majority of it, what, what, what you can do. How accurate is the CAT exam? Well, let me tell you, Taylor, I worked really hard to make the CAT exam especially like the NCLEX. And so a part of it is just the conditions that you have to test under. So once you activate that CAT exam, it is a five hour exam. You can, you can go the entire five hours. You cannot skip a question. You cannot come back to it. You have to persist in there. Some people say that my CAT exam is more challenging than the NCLEX. I will leave it up to you. I definitely do think that you are started out with easy questions and then it takes off from there. So I would say that if you pass my CAT exam, you are in a very, 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 very good, good chance of passing the NCLEX for sure. So do it because I believe you have the program. Do the CAT exam, at least do one. Oh, Rose. Okay. Rose says, good night, professor. By the grace of God, I am passing your, I'm going to pass my NCLEX exam or yeah, I'm passing my NCLEX exam. Yes, you can do this. Yes, you can do this. How can I get the materials? It is easy. Um, go to remarnurse.com. Go to remarnurse.com and you are able to get the V2. I want to go to it just so you can see i we'll just Google the website, remarnurse.com here. And what you're going to do is you're going to start by right here and pick whether you're at a registered nurse or practical nurse. Okay. Registered nurse or practical nurse. And then when you click on it, you will be able to see, you will be able to see, um, join the V2 is here. All right. And you'll be able to click on this green button. If you go to remarnurse.com and you're able to sign up for the V2, you are also able to take a free trial of the V2. I always want to encourage you guys, if you are interested in how my program works in the system and you can see how quickly you're able to understand the information, you don't have to wait for, um, you know, indefinitely. What I can say is you won't have to watch long, long videos the majority of my videos in V2 are less than 20 minutes. And so if you have 20 minutes for one topic, then you're able to definitely master this information. You're definitely able to master this innovation. So um, my, I think my pregnancy video is one of my longer ones. Pregnancy and clinical math. Pregnancy is 42 minutes. Newborn is 14. Infant heart defects is 10. Pediatric milestones, developmental milestones is number 21 minutes. Age-specific nursing care, 16. So this is all uh, this is all part of the course. And again, 20 study sessions, 20 study sessions is all it takes for you to get this information in. And there is progress exams as well, which I think are very important. Okay. <laughs> I need you guys to see, I need you guys to see that it is possible. It's really possible, especially if you've just been doing questions. So Taylor, you have it. Okay. It looks just like NCLEX. Oh, okay. Tina. So you have E2. 
never sure how to use it. I'm here every every night. I mean, every night that I'm on Monday and Wednesday, I want you guys to see V2. I want you to ask me any questions about it. I had the first VT and I brought the next gen. Can I use the same workbook? I got the next gen quick facts. Girl, yes, you can. You can if you have, I'm trying to see if I have a copy of it. I don't think I have it, but I know what you're talking about. You have the VT workbook. You can use the VT workbook for the lectures in V2. Mm, you just won't, the questions are all different. They're totally different. So you wouldn't be able to do that. Okay. Lydia, let me know what you emailed me about. What time is it? Do the CAT exam. Look at the schedule. Do we get a rationale for the CAT exam? So no, Ruth, you don't get a rationale for the CAT exam. And that is only because it would not be a true CAT exam if you did that. Um, part of the computer adaptive testing that makes the integrity of it consistent is that you will get a pass or fail, just like the NCLEX, you'll get a printout and it'll look just like the NCLEX. It'll have um, Ruth, like it'll say, you can't really see it, but it'll say passing standard or not passing. Let me see if I can pull one up from a question bank. It'll say you know, you passed, you didn't pass, and it'll give you each area that you were above, below, um, close to, all right? And that is because I have a whole question bank. If you want to see exams and you want to look at rationales, you can just make questions in the CAT exam. I'm sorry, in the question bank. Here's a CAT exam that I want to show you. I'll show you what the printout looks like. So this is the one CAT exam. And this is the this is the question bank, actually, guys. So 2,300 questions in the question bank. These are all free for you to do, different difficulty levels. But at the bottom of this is your test history. So every exam that you take, the V2 will remember it. And so when it comes to the computer adaptive exams, you are able to look at your, um, you're going to be able to look at how you did. And this may be a little bit hard to see, but essentially it'll tell you that you have passed your CAT exam or you haven't passed your CAT exam. And then it will give you the content areas that you were above passing, below passing in. And the reason why I give you this is because you need to be able to use your CAT exam results to continue to study, okay? Continue to study. And so again, this is in your, your question bank section. And you're able to see, okay, my history. Now, if you want to do questions and create a test, it's really simple to do. You just go to, um, you know, you're going to click here, go to create a test. You have to name your test if you want to do a next gen test. Always put next gen. I don't know why, but... And then these are the modes that you can do your test in. Let me spell test the right way. You can do a tutored test where you get the answer right away. You can do a test test where you actually are just going through the test and getting the rationale at the end. This is also where you do your computer adaptive test, guys. So all of this is in the question bank, okay? And then with the um, difficulty level, you could do all easy moderate or hard. It's up to you. If you just want to come in and do easy questions, then you can do easy questions. Yes. So the question, the CAT exam is in the question bank. It's right here. And you have two available with your V2 subscription. Somebody asked how many questions are on the CAT exam. So your CAT exam is computer adaptive. And that means that you may get the minimum of, um, 85 or you may get the maximum of 150 okay and so that's up to you when it cuts off and it is based off of your own performance your own performance all right so um when you are doing your subjects you, you it's a, i mean it's a functional question bank where you get to choose the subjects right and so you can pick whatever category of subjects that you want you just check the ones that you want to do and you're able to 
pick however many you want to do. And you can pick whether they're timed or untimed. And again, the reason why you can pick that is because you're just making questions in the question bank. But when it comes to your computer adaptive test, you'll be able to create your test. When it comes to your computer adaptive test, then you will not be able to, to do that. Okay, so let me go here and let me continue to test. All right, and you're able to do case studies. Um, six questions in a set. Again, I think these are the best for having to um, practice your reading, the radio style questions. Okay, that's going to be very important for you to be able to do. And I want to make sure that you guys understand that this is a part of the content lectures post work. So nobody should be starting, if, especially if you've been out of school for longer than like three months. This is your second, third time taking the NCLEX. The question bank is not the primary place that you should start. The question bank is secondary, okay, secondary. And I'm just going through questions here, making sure I understand it or just what it's asking me for. Um, and then I can go on here. This is actually asking the difference between renal calculi and acute renal failure and knowing the difference between those. I told you knowing differential diagnosis is challenging, but you guys can practice this and learn it. You guys can practice this and learn it. Okay. Okay. All right, guys. Do I have to watch the videos? What? Look at this. <laughs> scammers, man. They are here all over the place. Y'all have to be careful with the scammers. Mm. Okay, let's talk about this advice. Um, here we go. So I've been out of school for, for two years. I've been out of school for two years. Where do I start and what are the materials I need? I just got the new gen quick facts in the mail. So you've been out of school for two years. Um, thank you so much for giving yourself the opportunity to try again. What you're gonna have to do is do a content review lecture before you test. So you already have quick facts. You have half of my program. And if you look at the rest of my program, which I do suggest you get for these content lectures, you're going to see that a part of your studying is going to be to read that quick facts book. OK, that's going to be a part of it. And you're going to do questions from quick facts. And then you're also going to do the pharmacology section in the back. Now, what you're missing and what you need to include are the lecture topics, which are what I have you watching. OK, these are topics that you need to be very familiar with. You need to actually be very familiar with them. Let me just be plain. You need to know them before you test again. So I need you to get the rest of the program, get these lectures before you test again. I'm glad you have quick facts. Start with that for sure. But you still have to get these other subjects mastered. Even if you don't choose to get my lectures, you got to get this information from somewhere else. OK, because it's very important. And like I said, there are some things that you can read about. Like there's some subjects that you can read about. I do believe Huntington's disease was one of them. Another one you're going to read about is multiple sclerosis. Uh, you can't see this. Munchausen syndrome. These are things you can read and have comprehension. There's other principles in nursing that I don't think that just reading about it gives you the understanding. So, um, for example, what do I have here? Um, EKG. EKG overview is something I like to lecture on because it is a topic that is complex. Isolation precautions. You have to have a certain understanding. Management of care, legal issues, prioritization, delegation. There is not, I have never come across a book that explains prioritization to the level that you need to know it for multiple scenarios for NCLEX. I haven't seen one. There is books that will give you a ton of prioritization questions, but to actually explain it, you need to hear it. You need to hear it, all right? So get the lectures. 
Lydia, um, I don't know how to renew. It's not showing anything. It just says, sorry, there's nothing to renew here. Are you in the trial version, Lydia? Let me know. Rose, Rose says, your program is truly a blessing. I passed my NCLEX exam on Friday. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rose. Congratulations. Um, can you download the videos in V2? You cannot download those videos in V2. Um, I purchased the old Quick Facts book. I get this question a lot. I think it's a really great question. I purchased the old Quick Facts book. I don't think I have one, but you have the old one. Should I purchase the new one? I would say this. If you don't have the lectures, prioritize getting the lectures over purchasing another book. Because again, the lectures have different information that's, than what's in the quick facts and you still need it. You, you need that information. So focus more on getting the lectures than buying another quick facts. Okay. You don't have to watch the videos before buying. Okay. Can I redo the exam in the lessons? Not once you pass it. There is a minimum uh, that you have to get of 60% in the exams, the progress exams. So if you don't get that 60%, V2 is going to make you take that test again. But once you pass it, you're able to go back through it and look at all your answers and your questions. Marie, you already have the, pro you already have the program, right, Marie? You've been at school for 10 years. Let me know if you already have the program because, Marie, we've been talking a lot. We've been talking a lot. Is adaptive test the same as CAT tests? So computer adaptive tests, it is a term that essentially means your exam is giving you questions based off of your previous answer. That is a computer adaptive test, right? However, there are certain features of the computer adaptive test that should be in place if it wants to mimic the NCLEX. One of those is that you have varying levels of difficulty in that exam. The second one is that you truly are in an experience that you can't choose to leave from, right? Because that exam is going to calculate based off of your previous answer, okay? So that means if you're taking a computer adaptive test and you're able to skip a question because you don't know the answer to it, then that exam is not going to give you a true picture of what you currently know. It is going to give you a fake sense of security because you're allowed to skip difficult questions that you don't know the answer to. Does that make sense? So I know that there is, um, you know, exams out there that people call computer adaptive exams, but they allow you to, to take it like a regular test. And so you just have to be careful um, about that, those experiences. Okay. Okay. Okay, guys, I think that's it. Look at, <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, is conjunctivitis universal contact airborne precaution? So um, you have to, that's a trick question almost because there's different types of conjunctivitis. So if a person has allergic conjunctivitis, then that's not going to be contagious because it's due to their allergies. Okay. Please, is there any way you can give a lecture on EKGs? So I do have a lecture on EKGs in the V2. If that's a, something that you struggle with, definitely um, I want you to make sure that you understand that, that concept. So I already have that prepared. Um, and, there, and there are some reasons you may be thinking, well, why can't you just tell us? One of the reasons why there are certain things that I do on YouTube and then there are certain things that I reserve for the training in my system is because I am building the way I lecture for V2, it is because I've already been building on other subjects before EKGs so that I don't have to spend an hour explaining it to you. Because if you look at EKGs, 
EKG is less than 13, okay, in my program. It's at the end. I don't do prioritization and delegation until the end, okay? Um, and so the thing about it is before I think a nursing student can understand these principles, they have to have gone through all this other stuff. There's so much other content that you have to know in order to be able to manage the concepts of prioritization. And I think it's the same with EKGs and the interventions and delegation. Like you have to know a certain amount of content before those higher level processes make sense, okay? Or, or it doesn't take as long to explain them. I don't wanna have to spend an hour trying to teach you something um, just because I feel like during that hour, I'm probably gonna lo lose you at some point and it's gonna take you longer to understand. Okay. Okay. All right, guys. I'm out of here. I'm out of here. I'm out of here. What is the percentage of the CAT or study test needs to pass NCLEX? So for NCLEX, oh, if you want to do a percentage, it's about a 50% on the actual NCLEX exam, which doesn't seem like it's a lot, but it is a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, guys. God bless you so much. Thank you for joining class today. And I appreciate your time that you took out of your day. We've been studying for over an hour. And I know that you have lives and you have a lot of things that are vying for your attention. So I am, I am really happy that you're able to prioritize your studying session. Okay. Prioritize your studying session for this special time. Okay. It won't be a long time. It will not be a long time. I promise you we can study we can do what we have to do, and then we can go off and enjoy the rest of our lives, okay? I know I'm so excited for Vegas. I literally find myself in Vegas every year, and people think, like, Vegas is just, like, gambling and partying, but I don't do any of those things. Like, I don't do any of those things. I don't gamble. I don't drink. I don't go out to clubs, and me, I have such a great time in Vegas, basically just watching shows and eating. Like I'm one of those people that just like to eat and look around at people <laughs> and nobody really knows me there. Like, you know, and it's just, just like, I get to just people watch it. You guys, you guys get down with just like people watching so much fun, so much fun. So, um, there's also a church that I want to visit that I went there last year and, um, I was having issues. Like I was just not feeling well when I went there last year and I was just having trouble just like getting through the day and I went up there for prayer and the elders they laid their hands on me and they prayed that day I felt better like when I walked out of that church I felt so much better and so now like a year later I want to go back and go to that church and give a testimony like you guys that prayer healed me and I'm back to say I'm better than ever baby so I haven't really figured out how that speech is going to go yet, but I'm that's that's what I got so far. So thank you guys. Whew. Mm, great, great time. And I'll be back on Monday and I might do a pop up study session. So click the subscribe button so you guys can follow me. But again, if nobody told you you're amazing and guess what? You can, you will and you must pass and clicks. <laughs>